Therefore, we should never forget that the faith we talk about is a mental state. It is nothing spiritual. Faith is not a spiritual thing. It's to convince our mind about something that something will happen. It's always connected with expectations. And expectations only arise in the mind. Therefore, faith by itself is limited to the functioning of the mind. The spiritual path starts from above, above the mind. And therefore, it does not involve faith at all. Faith is not necessary for spirituality. But faith is necessary for the mind to take a leap forward into the spiritual realm. So we need faith only. While our mind is in doubt and the mind is not able to convince itself to move forward, we use faith to move forward. Now let me come to what is blind faith. By its very definition, as I explained, that if I have got a promise from a friend in whom I have faith, that he will come at 10 o'clock in the morning, faith till he comes is blind because he hasn't come. Supposing I say my faith started when he actually came and it's experience. Therefore, I have faith. That's not faith. That's experience. He actually came. Where is the faith then? So faith to start with appears to be somewhat blind anyway. So therefore, there is something connected with faith and with the mind and with time. That means an expectation and then it grows. So when we distinguish between a blind faith and a living faith, we are distinguishing between that which continues to be the same no matter what happens and that which changes with the experiences you get with it. That means if I have faith in a person, he will come at 10 o'clock in the morning and he arrives, my faith is built. And then I feel next time he will also come. And if he comes, my faith is further built up. But if he does not come, my faith begins to dwindle. So faith varies depending upon the experiences we get from faith. So that is why faith is not a steady thing. What is blind faith, which we refer to and say reject blind faith in spirituality, is a faith that does not vary at all. It's a faith based upon somebody's statement. God is sitting up on the roof. I believe it. It will always be the same statement. No change. Most of the religions tend to give us statements on which we have faith. And the statements remain the same throughout our life. There is nothing that is going to change them. And therefore, we call it blind faith. Whereas, if the faith can change, every time an experience takes place, the faith changes, then it's a growing faith, a living faith. And we distinguish blind faith not from visible faith, but blind faith from living faith, which is more visible because we are actually experiencing different things step by step. Supposing you have faith for some ultimate goal, <clears throat> but there are many steps to the ultimate goal, and you get experiences of the intermediate goals, your faith keeps on increasing. Because you say this much has happened, the next is also likely. What has happened is experience, not faith. What you are expecting as the next step is faith. Therefore, faith steps itself and becomes a living, progressive experience for us. So when we say do not have blind faith, we are referring to a faith which has no life in it, no growth in it, and we just believe because somebody said something, some books said something, some religion said something, some scriptures said something, we say, okay, that's the truth, and we don't move any forward. So when there's movement forward, it becomes a living faith. And that is why we distinguish between the living faith and the blind faith. Now comes the question that is blind faith or faith anyway a spiritual thing? I said no, because these expectations of goals, of destinations, that I will one day reach my true home and reach such khand, these are expectations. Expectations only arise in the mind. Therefore, faith is a mental process. Faith is to convince mind that take a leap forward, move forward. Because the mind's tendency is to come in the way of the spiritual path. The mind creates obstacles. And the mind is such a wonderful instrument we have, such a good thinking machine. Why should it become an obstacle? It becomes an obstacle because our desires and attachments are with external experiences of the mind through sense perceptions. It has no internal experience. 
<clears throat> therefore the mind relies heavily on what it can get from outside. We try to push inside, mind naturally is not going to be a partner, an ally in that. Therefore, the mind tries to keep us out, we try to go in, the mind becomes an obstacle in order for the mind to be <clears throat> a partner in our business, we try to create faith and make have expectations and give the mind a chance to see. See, this one step happened. Now next will happen. Mind says, okay, let's see. They say, see, something that we had inside in experience in meditation <clears throat> was as good as what you're looking for outside. Mind says, okay, and go along with you. It's a progressive transformation of the mind to become a helper instead of an obstacle in our spiritual goal. It's still a mind game. The whole process of faith, the whole process of expectations, the whole process of moving forward is only to the extent that we need to turn the mind around to help us and not be an obstacle in our spiritual goal. Then what is there after the mind? We say the spiritual goal is beyond the mind. What is that which is beyond the mind and does not involve faith at all? You might be surprised to know that the only thing that takes us beyond the mind and to our true spiritual home is the power of love, the power of love and devotion, not faith. Faith only takes us to the doorstep of true love. Beyond that, it's only the power of love that can take us. When perfect living masters come here, they take care of our journey from here. They know we are taking our physical bodies to be our only reality. They know we are taking the self to be our physical self. Therefore, they start from here. They say, avoid certain things. Don't eat meat. Do meditation. Two and a half hours. These are instructions for the physical body. Knowing well that this physical body has nothing to do with spirituality. But they are starting because we are here. We know no better than that. We are identifying the self, the true self of ours with this physical body to so start from here. And they give instructions. And as we follow the instructions which they give us, something starts happening. And we don't notice it. Not too much in the beginning. We think that avoiding meat, avoiding these things, doing meditation, that's what's going to take us back home. It never has, never will. It's only a means to an end. It's not the end. It's a means to create that connection between a person in whom we are beginning to have faith because he's giving these instructions and we follow and something else is holding on to that person, not this practice. What is holding on to that practice is a feeling of love and devotion that's growing in us. Unknowingly. We don't even know what's going on. We think it's the meditation, it's the abstinence from food, alcohol, all those things that he has told us, that is helping us to grow spiritually. What is helping us to grow spiritually is that we are getting more and more connected with that person who gives these instructions and makes us feel closer to him. We don't give the importance to that because our mind gives importance to our own struggle. Mind gives importance to our own effort. So we say, yeah, I put in this effort, therefore I'm moving forward. Actually, the effort is merely to create the feeling of love and devotion. And as we proceed with this effort, we find that the love keeps on growing somewhere, unseen. We can see our thoughts. We can see our body. We can see everything that happens outside. But we can't see love. It's growing somewhere inside. Where does love grow? Where does love come from? Where does it grow? Do you know love comes from such kind of true home? All the time. Not sometimes. All the time it flows from our true home, comes down right up to here and continues to grow within us. It's a continuous link between the self, no matter what the form, and our true home. Therefore, the path actually is a path of love and devotion. And by giving us these instructions, first for the body, then for sense perceptions, avoid this, avoid this, or do this, do that, we are crossing certain thresholds, which are only thresholds of the three worlds of matter and senses and thoughts. It's only to cross these thresholds 
that we are using these methods in order to go to the spiritual side of our own self, which is the soul going into a state of totality, which is the true spiritual man. Therefore, when we have expectations, which, which, which we call faith, these are merely built in order to have experiences starting from the body, starting from the sense perceptions and the thoughts, and then moving on beyond where we leave all these behind and ride on the wave of love, which is something very different than expectations or fulfillment of the desires and faith. So that is why we do not follow blind faith, we follow faith that is living faith, that is growing faith, that ascends along with our experiences. Now comes the question which my friend has referred to. He had no inner experience. My first question will be, if after so many years you got no experience, why are you writing to me? There's something going on that you still think that uh, I'll be give, give, able to give you an answer. What is this subtle thing behind this that you still believe with no experience that I still give you an answer? Something has connected us. It has given you faith that I'll give an answer. You don't see that. We don't see that part. What is that part which still makes us believe that he can give us the answer? I have seen no experience at all. It is actually a love growing inside which develops a different kind of feeling and we can't call it the kind of faith that we talk about. And therefore, again, it's love superseding any expectations of any kind of experiences. <clears throat> but then let me come now to the brass tacks. How important are these experiences on the spiritual path? It's a big question. I had to ask my own great master once. How important are these inner experiences the spectacle, the visual experiences we see in meditation on the spiritual path. And his answer was very little. It surprises me. All the time we talk of you go to this stage, you will see these things. You go to the astral stage, you will fly into the astral sky. You will have all these experiences. And suddenly, a perfect living master like great master says they don't have much significance. Because he has seen and I have seen People have had most spectacular experiences in meditation. They flew into the high skies. They saw the orange sky. They went to the causal plane. They saw their Akashic records. And some bad incident that happened in physical life threw away all that faith and they lost faith. How important are these visuals then? If you can still lose faith, whereas somebody who has never seen anything inside, his love is growing for the master. He says, I care for nothing else but my master. He is in me all the time. I am in him all the time. That's how I feel. I feel so much love coming to me. And I can't live without this love. The man has seen nothing and is making good spiritual progress. And when he meditates, he crosses all these stages and finds something even beyond the mind. So let us put this in perspective. That what is important is not necessarily one or the other. What is important is that you can make progress on the spiritual path both ways. Some people are fond of spectacle. They are fond of visual experiences and they love those visual experiences and they get them. And they measure their, they measure their spiritual growth. They measure their progress on the spiritual path based upon those visuals that they see inside. Others don't measure like that. They measure from how much closer they are feeling to their masters. How much love has developed in them, how much they feel, how much they miss their master. They judge from that. Meditational experiences are a good way to make progress for those who are very keen on that. But there are experiences that are non-meditational. Experiences that don't occur in meditation, they occur with your eyes open in this world. We call them miracles. We call them coincidences. Every day things happen and we look at our life and say, how could this happen? Must be master's hand in this. How could that happen? And as these number of coincidences increase, our faith, our love for the master increases. Are they not experiences? How can we say 
that the inner experience alone is the one that is to count and not the outer experiences. In fact, I remember a master saying, Antar bahar eko jano yahi guru gyan bataya. Inside and outside are exactly the same. Now this is something worth considering. How can inside and outside be the same? The fact is that the entire outside experience is being created from the inside. Unless it occurs inside, it cannot be outside. Outside is a reflection of what is happening inside. Therefore, do not think that there's an independent life going on outside and an independent life inside and two are divided up. They're not divided up. What is inside is being projected outside. It is projected to create a material experience. Inside you can have an astral experience, but just a projection of one on outside the other. It's not two different things. Therefore, when we say we have an experience outside, it is no different from the experience inside. Well, when, when you see the master's radiant form inside and you have a good conversation with the master inside and establish a contact inside that all the time, whenever you like, first by closing your eyes, you can see the master talk to him, then later on, even without closing your eyes, with open eyes, you can see him all the time and talk to him. And you say, Master, what's the difference? between this form of you, which I am seeing in meditation, and that form of you I saw in your physical body. And he will say, for the purpose of instructions, this is more real because the outside will be created by the air. In truth, they are the same. If they were not the same, why would we pay so much attention to the physical form of a master outside? Why do we run to him? Why does he come initiation inside, uh, outside? Why does he talk to us outside? Why, uh, why do we have a relationship with the master outside? The truth is there is no difference. And that is why when we, our whole attention is outside, he appears outside. In fact, it would be a correct statement to say that the perfect living master that guides us to our true home is always inside. We don't look inside, therefore he appears outside. It will be a correct statement. That they are not independent, they are not separate. That is why we should take it seriously that the outer experiences, which are equally miraculous, and the inner experiences of visuals inside, both are equally important. And both lead us to the same feeling of love and devotion, which ultimately takes us beyond the mind. We link it with faith. We link it with our mental expectations. We link it and create faith because we have to cross the mind. And we are building faith in the mind, not in the soul. Soul needs no faith. Soul only needs love. Mind needs faith. Therefore, in order to turn the mind around, to be a partner with the soul in our journey, we use faith and use living faith that grows with every experience we have, whether the experience is inside or outside. It doesn't matter. There is a tendency to distinguish between these two for one reason. That we have been told this is a negative world and we have to leave it and go inside to find a positive world. We believe that everything outside must be negative. In the realm of calm, in the realm of time, it's all being run by a negative power that wants to hold us here by our desires and attachments and inside is all positive. That is not true either. If the inside and the outside are the same, how can the inside be more positive than the outside? People who had the good opportunity to succeed in meditation and have great experiences in the astral plane inside, were caught up there for thousands of years till they begged their master to take us back into the physical world again so we can make more progress. So how is that more positive? Then the outside is the physical. All are negative right up to the causal plane. The physical experience is run by the same power, negative power of time and space that is running the astral plane, that is running the causal plane where all these worlds exist. None of them is positive. The only positive part is when you are sent beyond the mind. The mind itself is a unit of the negative power. Just like the soul is a unit of totality of consciousness. Soul 
is a representative unit, small unit representing God, the creator himself. Like the soul is a unit of totality of consciousness, the mind is a unit of time of the negative power. So all three worlds of the mind are negative. The positive starts beyond it. But we are working here through these steps. A friend of mine in India once asked me that I have understood well that these three regions, the physical, the astral, and the causal which you describe are all negative. Then why are we in our meditation using a simran, using repetition of a mantra which repeats the three words of these three words? It's very unfair that we should be actually appreciating something that is so negative. Why should we not repeat two words? And there's great controversy among some schools in India about two words or five words. And why should we not repeat two words which are beyond the mind and confine ourselves to the truth instead of going on repeating words which don't refer to this? That man asked me this question and I said I'll go and revert to my master. So I went to my master, great master, Hazur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh Ji. I said, my friend wants to know why are we repeating five words, three of them are referring to the regions of the mind, the physical, the astral and the causal. And why should we not only refer to the words that are beyond the mind? And the master smiled and he said, if I place a ladder against this wall, it has five steps to go. Would you go to the top on the two steps at the top only? Don't you think that to climb a ladder, to start from the bottom? It's like a ladder that we are climbing. We have to go through these three phases of experiences which are run by the negative power, but unless you want to go through them, you don't reach the fourth place. Therefore, we are not paying any homage to these three places. We are just saying, okay, step one, step two, step three, now we are on our fourth step. It's just like climbing a ladder. So which made sense. We are not saying that these, and in any case he told me, the most significant part the great master said was, in any case all the five words mean nothing because they are simple language that is spoken only here. It is not even spoken in the causal plane. It's not even spoken in the mental regions. So what are we talking about speaking of words? These are all devices to be used while we are here. These words are spoken because we love to speak. These words are spoken because we are using these words to prevent other words from coming into our thoughts. It's a very limited use of these words. These words do not mean anything beyond the mind. So don't go after words too much. They don't mean much. They are only very small means to make some progress. Therefore, he said, it doesn't matter what experiences you have. You can have inner experiences, outer experiences so long as the experiences are in these three worlds, they are experiences which are only building faith for the mind to take you beyond the mind and they serve no other purpose. So these are startling truths that we should be aware of because we get caught up in these things. We, we argue so much on interpretation of books. I see people interpreting one sentence from the same book and giving different meanings and fighting over it. Sometimes coming to blows over it. That no, this doesn't mean that, this doesn't mean that. Nothing means anything here anyway. <laughs> These are all simple things, tools for us to make some, take some advantage and move forward. And we get stuck on these things. We get stuck on these books, we get stuck on these words. They are very simple tools. And the truth is that there is only one way the spiritual path that is love and devotion and that takes us beyond because that is connected with us not only is it connected with us right from here to our true home it is our real essence if you want to examine a soul and say what is a soul what does this consciousness consist of that this unit of consciousness which is making us aware of everything aware of our body aware of our higher self aware of God, what is this consciousness is? And you open it up and see, inside is nothing but love. When they say God is love, I would say literally true. Because love is the essence. Love is the essence that connects us. And remember, the self, what we call the self, no matter what self it is, 
is always connected with our true home. The consciousness that speaks in us today, the consciousness which makes us alive today, with which we can share information with each other, by which we can speak, it is coming from a certain area which looks like confined to a physical body. It looks like there is a body and there is consciousness in it. The truth is the other way around. The truth is there is consciousness, it's built a body around it. You can check it out. How do you check out whether it's the body that is containing the consciousness in, in it, or soul in it, or the soul is creating a body around it? How do you check it out? Well, you know that the consciousness is applying attention to have all experiences outside. It uses attention to gather experiences. We look at things with attention. We hear things with attention. We use our sense perceptions with attention. Okay, pull the attention back. Pull your attention back, put all the attention within. Out, not outside, not in the body, behind the eyes where you think your thoughts, your questions are coming from. Put the attention there and become totally unaware of the body. And you'll be there and body is not there. After that, slowly expand, you'll see how you create the awareness of the body. It's not difficult to find out it's not the body that contains the soul, it's the soul that creates the body. Move one step further and say, are my sense perceptions in the body? Am I having eyes therefore I can see? Is it my ears that are able to hear? Is my tongue able to speak? Okay, do the same experiment again and you'll find that when there's no body in your awareness, you can still speak, you can still see, you can still hear, you can have all the sense perceptions. That means this body did not hold the sense perceptions. Something inside held you. If you can go still further and hold your attention, only attention, within yourself, and withdraw them from all perceptions, you'll find that the sense perceptions are also being created by the same power, which is your own self. Move further. Where are thoughts arising from in my head? Where are concepts arising from? And you go further, deeper into your own self. Same self which is now sitting in the body, then sitting in the astral sensory self, then sitting in the midst of the thoughts. Withdraw there, you create the thoughts, you are creating the mind, you are creating the senses, you are creating the body. It's a reversal of what's going on. We are, we are going outward in order to have all these experiences. Go inward and you reverse it. Reverse engineer yourself and you find that you are really the soul, the creative power is creating all these covers upon itself to have these experiences. And yet because we believe that the body is real and soul is inside, and we will begin to say, that person died, his soul went out, and then went into a reincarnate another body. We talk like this, taking these bodies to be real. Continuously this belief. Why? Because we have shut ourselves off from the whole process of creation. We do not know how experience is being created. We have shut ourselves off by covering it with so many things and we think the outer covers are ourselves. But what will happen if you discover who your real self is that creates these covers? You'll find the real self continuously is the same self that is in the true home and has never changed. It's the continuous experience of the same self, starting from the true home, creating levels of experiences not because there is anything to descend into another experience, because we are covering ourselves with new forms of experiencing and therefore we have new experiences. We never left our true home. The whole show is taking place there. There is no journey involved to go back. Supposing you go to sleep at night and you have a long journey in your dream. You say, no, I'm going to go back and wake up. When you wake up, you never went on a journey. You went into a different form of experience. You went into a different level of consciousness. And you woke up. When you woke up, you finish your journey, not by going anywhere, but by being where you were all the time. It's the same thing in spiritual experience. It's, that is why they sometimes don't like to call it a spiritual journey. They like to call it spiritual awakening. Because we are progressively, successively awakening to higher levels of experiences which brings us closer and closer to our true self, ultimately we find our true self is the ultimate totality of consciousness that creates everything. And we never left it. 
not till now, not till this body. It's the same stream working. It's the same stream carrying the power of love in it. The self and the love go continuously from one level to another, never break. Experiences break. The experiences of dream and awakefulness is different, but the person having the dream is the same. Have you ever noticed this? That if you go to sleep and you are moving around the dream, who is that guy? Who is that person who moves around in a dream and says, I am seeing this, I am seeing this, and then you wake up? Was it the same person who went to dream or a different one? Did you see another person walking around or were you walking around? You will notice it is always the same. Whether you have a dream or you have an astral experience or a causal experience or a spiritual experience, the self, the experiencer is always the same and unchanged. Everything else changes except the experiencer, except the self. Therefore, when you are on a spiritual path like this, we are dealing with different parts of it. We are dealing with the problem of misidentification with the body. We do the very minimum things with our body, taking it to be real. We go to another person, be created by ourselves, call him a master. Say he's a master. Master not outside, he's inside, projecting outside. We say we want your support, we know you know more than me. Of course he knows as much as your inner real self knows because your real self is the same as this master. So you get all the external experience of being separate from a master. He, te he says, go inside and you will find who I am. We go inside and we found master was always inside, not outside, but we saw him outside. Then we move forward. All these different experiences take place to a greater awakening, awakening. Ultimately, experiences lead to a complete discovery of the whole show of how it's being produced. Isn't it wonderful to be able to know that the whole thing is happening in our own true home? We have created a big show out there and created levels of experiences, levels of worlds outside, fathomless worlds, vast worlds outside at every level. And then we have been able to place ourselves as a self, as one small being in those vast worlds which we have created. What a wonderful miracle to be able to create these. And we have performed that miracle and today we are sitting in a stage, in a place where we can reverse the miracle, where we can reverse this process. The whole show is not designed to be reversible. The whole show is designed to be irreversible. Why is that? Why was this creation made in such a way that should last forever and trap us forever in these kind of experiences? The reason was we wanted to experience reality. We were real. We wanted to see real experience. Experience can never be real. Yet we wanted to see experience as real like ourselves. Like the experiencer. We wanted to make experience real. And we succeeded very well. We created experiences which looked absolutely real. They looked more real than us. We identified ourselves with the body. <coughs> And the body perishes and the experience seems to stay on forever. We created a history in this experience, a time frame of vast past and vastness of future. So the vast universe we created looked more permanent than us. We were merely small flies coming for a little, uh, little time and then we die. The rest of the world will go on merrily, never discovering that we are creating this whole experience ourselves. Therefore, we did not go out merely having an adventure. We went out creating a real adventure in reality. We did not create levels of illusions. We created levels of reality. And that's what we wanted to experience. And one of the main significant features of that was we shut our own self off so that it looked real continuously. If we continuously know how we made up this show, then how can it be real? We know we are just making it up. We we'll always be conscious of the fact it's all a made-up show. We have not experienced reality in that case. But when we shut our own self off and hide ourselves inside somewhere and then see the show from there, peep out and see the show through our peeping eyes, and then we say, this is all real, it makes reality. Now, is it what I'm saying almost would give the impression 
that's nice to enjoy this reality while it is there. And once we go to the top and find out it is not real, we'll be very disappointed. We'll say, we made a fool of ourselves all this while, that we thought that this created reality was uh, actually real and it wasn't. Will we be disappointed? Not at all. When you go to that stage, you will see that you have been creating so many realities and you can step from one to the other. It's an unending process. It's not unending because there is no time there. I once wanted to write a little story, 65 years ago. I wanted to write about consciousness. I wanted to write what is consciousness, examine it like a doctor examines a body. I called it Anatomy of Consciousness. I wrote the title, Anatomy of Consciousness. I wrote the first sentence. I couldn't think of what I could write. I said, we are conscious because we are conscious. I couldn't <laughs> go beyond that. Twenty years later, I was still stuck with that one line. I crossed the line because we can't be we. There's, there's no we. There's no, no more than one. Then I wrote, I am conscious. I cross out I. There can be no I unless there is we. There cannot be one unless there's many. I said, what am I talking about? I'm writing about a guy in his true home. And I can't start even. I said, no, the guy is there, he's invisible. Why is he invisible? Because there is no space to be visible in. I said, the guy must first create space to become visible. With no space, you can't be visible. Therefore, I said, let's see if we can create space. When the guy tried to create space, he found to have space, you have something like here to there. You can't have space without it. Suddenly discovered here to there means time. And there is no time, so he couldn't create space. So in order to create space, he had then to go back to create time. And he had a hard time creating time. But he managed to create time and put some events into it. But then they were all himself. Therefore, he had to hide them and make them into puppets and work with strings behind them. I'm telling you how hard it was for me to complete the story. I couldn't complete the story till today. Some years ago, my wife took up, took up that one line, <coughs> had written, and began to use the talks I have been giving. She said, you've been talking a lot and you can't write a single line. Then she began to write and a book came up. It's still available, Anatomy <laughs> of Consciousness. I still believe it's impossible to describe the truth. It's impossible to describe our true state. And yet, it's the very true state that is having all the experiences. It's our self that is having all these experiences inside and out. And we create so many different kinds of variety of experiences and make them so real. They can be subjected to scrutiny with microscopes and telescopes and they stand up to the scrutiny of reality. What else do we need? We've gone up to nanoparticles, we've gone up to little microbes working somewhere, we've gone to all kinds of analysis of the experience outside. If this is not real, what else can be real? What a wonderful job. I think it's the best job that could ever have been done. Once great master gave me a very beautiful assignment. At that time, I was proceeding on the spiritual path like it's a scientific adventure. So he gave me a beautiful task. He says, I'll give you one glimpse into this creation. Tell me where you can improve it. I said, I can improve a lot of things. There's so much suffering and so much terrible things going on. I'll avoid all those. I'll do something good. When I had a glimpse of the totality, how they are placed against each other, how the pairs of opposites are so necessary to create experience itself. I was not only tongue-tied, I was pen-tied, I couldn't do anything. I went back to him, I said, I can't improve this perfection. When I saw only a little part of this creation, I found imperfections. When you see the whole thing, it's perfect. It's a perfect creation. It's not, a, it's not creators, it's a perfect creation. The creator who can create a perfect creation must be perfect too, by assumption. But the creation was perfect. I could do nothing. You try. Try to have a glimpse of the totality and tell me if you can make any change in it. 
This perfection is only visible when you can see the whole plane. We are so lucky to be in that small fraction, that small slice of experience created here, in which we can open the doors to the entire means in which the creation took place, the origin of creation, and our own true home, and our true self. And that little window, very small window available to us is a human life. A human being can do it, nobody else. Because it requires something that is totally unreal, and yet is operating as real and makes us available, make available to us a tool to open these doors and find out the truth within ourselves. And that unreal thing, which looks so real, we call free will. Free will looks so real. People tell me, if there is no free will, how come I am discussing this with you? I said, only answer I can give is, go to the astral plane, you'll see that you talked about it, like this earlier, and that's why you're talking now. Uh, over here I can't say, because it looks real. It not only looks real, it is a real experience. The real experience of free will makes us a real seeker, and a real seeker makes us find something real. What a wonderful gift. The best gift we could ever get is the gift of a human life, in which we have this wonderful gift of the experience of free will. A free will makes us choose between options. We can choose to run after outside things. We can choose to run and search something inside. It's our choice. In responding to my friend who wrote to me about faith, I would like to ask a few questions, and I would like to ask the same questions from those who raised this question, that I have done so much meditation, I have been initiated so long, and I don't have any experiences. I would raise a question. Can you review for yourself whether you did your homework? If you want results like an examination, want results on a scientific basis, then review if you did your homework. Do you do it adequately? Did you try, try again, if you didn't do it properly first time. Just follow the normal rules of a classroom. Secondly, I would say the main purpose of meditation on going on the spiritual path is to withdraw your attention from here to there. Mystic Bullesha says, it's not difficult to find God. Just pull from here, put there. He said one sentence, he summarizes the whole spiritual path. It's a pulling of attention. Now review, my dear friend, now review how much of your attention in the past three years, or past one year, past one month, was outside of things outside, what you were desiring and what you were working on, and how much of your attention was being pulled inside. Is there any balance between the two, or was it all outside? And when you review these things, what will you find? I was constantly looking for things outside, worried about my job outside. I was searching for things outside, searching for pleasure outside, going to nice restaurants to have good food outside, running for sex outside, running for all kinds of pleasure on the flesh outside. Oh my God, I was running all the time outside. I have no right to ask that question. Because all the time I am putting my attention outside. We have a very fundamental principle of success in meditation is to begin to withdraw your attention and put it inside. How much of the time did you give to these? And if you can just evaluate yourself, what were you busy with? What were you doing when you were expecting results? What happened when you were initiated five years ago or three years ago till today? How much of the time was spent in searching inside and putting your attention inside and how much was spent on searching for things outside? Just evaluate for yourself and come to your own conclusion. We have scattered our attention, but I am saying don't lose hope. In spite of this difficult question, tantalizing question that I am putting to these people who say we haven't had experience for so many years, because I can point out to them, where was your attention all these few years? But I say don't lose hope, because as I said in the beginning, the outside and the inside are the same. Did you outside put your attention on the master? Did you outside give your time to satsangs? Give you outside give your time to things that would lead you inside? 
or were you still messing up your life in other things and not with these spiritual things? If your answer is, yes, I was messing up, then don't expect something and don't expect faith to be built on that. But if you follow these simple tips that I've given you, put more attention outside if you haven't seen anything inside. Put more attention outside and see the miracles outside. They're as good as the visuals inside. And you will make spiritual progress when you meditate. These are the answers I would like to give to my friends who have that question. We were initiated for many years. We never saw anything inside. And is it blind faith or is it real faith? Of course, if you only stick to one thing and there is no progress, no anticipation, no expectation, no progress even for your mind to say, I'm seeing some things going on, there is blind faith. But if you find any progress outside or inside, it's a living faith, and on that faith, you will make progress. I'm very happy to be able to share this information with you today. We'll have a break for a little while, and uh, the, I suppose there's some snacks and things, and some people have asked for an interview. <coughs> if somebody has come for the first time to my meeting, they'll get a precedence over others, but I've given time to one or two other people. I'll see them now. We'll have a break. Thank you very much.